Hi there, welcome to the book launch for Whirly Gig. This is my latest book available from the 26th of March, published by Fledgling Press and um, available from all good booksellers and online as well. The original plan was to do the launch uh, traditionally from Blackwells in Edinburgh and Dumblane Library. Uh, unfortunately, the coronavirus has put pay to that quite rightly so, because uh, we need to keep everyone safe. So instead, um, we're going to film it from my self-isolation booth here uh, at home, where this is my front room where I tend to do a lot of my scribbling. So you get an insight into the, uh, the author's uh, environment at the same time. Uh, you might notice uh, Woody uh, on the back there keeping an eye on me. I did have a Buzz Lightyear, but he's disappeared somewhere. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, never mind all that. Uh, Mark Leggett was meant to be accompanying me um, in the original plan, uh, and we're going to do a Q&A session. Uh, he's unfortunately not able to be with us either, so um, he has sent me, however, uh, uh, a list of questions, which is very good of him, and I shall endeavour to answer those for you, tell you a bit about the book, and, uh, and we'll start with uh, the first question from Mark, which was, what's the story about? So, I can say that it's set in the highlands of Scotland, uh, and involves a string of murders where the uh, uh, the mode of killing people is uh, done by bits of mechanical uh, equipment, I guess, uh, is, is the short answer to that. Uh, however, you have to read more to find out about it, but I can give you a bit of an insight into the plot uh, through the medium of uh, music. And uh, there's a couple of spoilers in here, but hopefully you're not, you're not getting them. <laughs> So that's basically the plot uh, through the medium of music and uh, I'll just put that there so it doesn't fall over 
Uh, hence on to the other questions which have come through. Um, so, was there a spark that gave you the idea for Whirligig or how the murders would be committed? I've only just recently started writing, uh, literally a couple of years ago. Um, uh, and this is my second book, Whirligig. The first book um, was called One is One and I couldn't find a publisher interested in taking it on. Probably because it crossed uh, a few genres. Um, I guess the, the simplest description of it would be fairy tartan noir. Uh, and there's not, not really space on the shelves for fairy tartan noir. So it's, um, it sits out there on Amazon and, uh, and nowhere else for the moment. Um, the driver for writing this book, I guess, I've always enjoyed crime fiction. I've always enjoyed the, uh, the challenge of trying to work out who is responsible for the murders and uh, spotting the obvious red herrings and uh, trying to get to the uh, the conclusion before the, the detective does. So that was, uh, I, I set myself the task of writing a, a, a straight detective novel. So the next question. There's a very strong sense of place. Are you familiar with the area in which the novel is set? Or is it fictional based on a real place? Uh, I'll share something with you, which no one else knows. Uh, and that's the uh, the plot is actually set in Fort William uh, in uh, the Highlands of Scotland there. And it's a place I do know because when I was uh, a lot younger, uh, I lived in South Wales when I was 18 or something. And that was back in the more innocent days, I guess, when uh, you could put your thumb out at the side of the road and hitch wherever you wanted to go. Uh, and I just made a right mess of my A-levels uh, and decided <laughs> I had to do something different. Uh, and I put my thumb out and the lifts took me all the way to Fort William. Uh, so I stayed there for a while and got a job with the Scottish Forestry Commission. And as a result, uh, got to know the area pretty well. Uh, certainly a lot of the trees around Loch Lochy um, uh, are growing tall and strong due to my, my tender care. Um, not all of them, I hasten to add. I, I was just part of a, a team of people climbing up and down the slopes. but. Um, great bunch of guys and uh, a beautiful scenery and that's very much stayed with me and in fact probably is one of the reasons that I, I'm living up in Scotland now although having a Scottish wife probably uh, also has uh, uh, an input on that. Uh, so yeah uh, based on an area I know well basically. Um, next question. I can see the first murder as opening the door to the plot did you see it the same way and build on it by building the town and characters around it? I guess yes is the is the short answer. Um, in fact, the first murder it will transpire as you, uh, if you read the book um, basically underpins the entire story and it's the history of the person who dies, his relationship with the tree. Uh, in which he's snared and uh, the, the sort of backstory that eventually comes to light that is the driver for the entire plot. So, um, yeah, the, the, the prologue is there for a very good reason because it, it, it opens the door to, uh, to what's happening, uh, gives you some ideas as to, as to what's happening and uh, the why of it you have to read to, uh, to find out. Uh, next question. There are great plot strands in the book where you think you know where it's going, only to be sent another way. Did you plot this or did they appear naturally and you just use them to intrigue the reader and keep them guessing? Uh, I was at the, the Collinsey Book Festival last year, 2019, and Collinsey, for those of you that don't know it, is a small island off the west coast of Scotland. And appearing at the festival was um, Anne Cleves. Now, um, uh, I've always enjoyed her work. Uh, she, of course, is responsible for the, uh, the Shetland uh, stories, um, for example. And so I was quite, I was, I was quite intrigued to, to, to listen to her talk. And someone in the audience asked a very, very similar question about plots and how she plots things and plot lines and whether she uses paper and pencils and all that sort of stuff. And the answer she came back with was quite a surprise because she works in exactly the same way I do. Um, and basically the plot develops as she writes it. 
Uh, and what she said at the time uh, at the book festival was uh, it was important for her that she didn't know at the outset how a plot went uh, because that would take away the whole interest for her in writing. Uh, cause she wants to know what the characters are doing uh, and how all the strands tie together as much as the reader. Uh, and that was quite a, re a revelation for me, um, because uh, a revelation even, uh, because that's how I work. Uh, and I thought I was the only person who did that. But no, um, a plot will eventually coalesce somewhere along the line. Uh, at least that's the hope. <laughs> if it doesn't, I guess you shove it in a drawer and, and come back another day. Do you have to do any particular research? For this book, I didn't do uh, much research at all. For my, my, my fairy noir, one is one, I, d I did a massive amount of research. Uh, I probably did more research than, than, than there is in the book. Uh, but um, for this one, no. The only thing I really looked at was, uh, was clockwork mechanisms. Um, and I guess neurotoxins. So I've got an interesting search history. But um, I've always been interested in clocks, even as a young kid. Uh, I used to go to jumble sales and... Uh, bring home massive <laughs> ornate Victorian timepieces, which all, always ended up uh, going back to the jumble cells. So, uh, uh, early um, circulation of, uh, of material, I guess. Um, and that's always sort of stayed with me. So, when I did the research for this, I, I did get a bit carried away. I don't know if other authors do this, uh, but I'd be looking at, for example, the um, uh, antiquarian clocks, such as the uh, antique. Cathera, I think that's how it's pronounced, uh, mechanism that they found off the coast of Crete uh, back in the 50s. And it just looked like a lump of rock with a few gears in it. But with uh, modern techniques, they were able to look deep inside it with x-rays and what have you. And came up with this incredibly complex mechanism, which um, not only gave the uh, position of the, the planets uh, at any time, but also uh, took into account the uh, the difference in... Uh, the regularity of the moon's orbit of the Earth as it uh, approaches the Earth and, and goes further away, uh, which is something uh, they never guessed for a second that could be understood in in antiquity. So this thing comes from, I don't know, 2,000 years ago, uh, and it's an amazing piece of, of clockwork mechanism. Um, so you know, that sort of thing I find <laughs> a bit too interesting, really, because it takes me away from writing the book. Another question. Boom, 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 boom. The motivation of the characters is very interesting. Did you want them all to have their own agenda without confusing things? Well, the characterization and the, and the motivation. I wanted, a, I wanted a, the murders to have a good reason. I didn't want them to be just uh, spurious acts of violence. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the, the, the character involved in doing the murders had to have good reason for this uh, and that comes out as the plot develops. The motivation of the other players, if you like, um, in terms of self-preservation and their history also comes into light. But I would think what, what is important is that characters have to remain true to themselves uh, as you go through a plot. Uh, don't perform, don't don't perform out of character. In effect, so yeah, I'm I'm hoping it all it all hangs together and uh, the characters perform very much as you'd expect them to do. Pen, pencil, crayons, or straight to keyboard? That's a very easy one. I went straight to keyboard. Um, I think probably one of the worst things you can do is stare at a sheet of paper. Um, and not put anything on it, just put something on it. You can always rub it out or throw it in the bin or delete. Uh, but if you don't make a start, you never get anywhere. Uh, that's always my philosophy. <laughs> um, here's one uh, Mark gets asked. Was the book, what was the book that made you think, I want to write a book? Was it a book that made you think, I can do better than that? Or was it, I want to write like that? I think a lot of the books that uh, influenced me uh, are from the sort of beginning of my uh, my life when I'm, I'm more impressionable. So you could put Orwell, Salinger, Tolkien, uh, Mervyn Peake, all these people uh, had had a huge impact and uh, I very much lived those books. Um, Laurie Lee even, uh, he was probably responsible for me disappearing off to Europe on a regular basis. <laughs> 
um, instead of getting on with a career. Um, all, all, all these books had a huge impact on me. Uh, more modern books, I guess, I'm looking at authors such as um, Ian Banks, who was taken far too soon, um, and his humanity just shines through everything he does. He's, he's a very good author. Um, what's next? Do you have another project on the go? Well, uh, Fledgling Press Clear has uh, asked me to write another uh, Kostorfin book, so I'm uh, well underway with that. Um, I'm also doing another book to follow on from One is One, uh, so more fairy noir. Uh, and I'm also writing an environmental disaster novel, but uh, I'm kind of being overtaken by events with that one, so uh, I might have to, to, to re-spin it. Um, and that was the end of his question. So the last thing for me to do is give you a quick excerpt, uh, which I'll do from the beginning. And just to set the scene, um, <clears throat> Oscar, the gamekeeper, who uh, isn't a very pleasant guy, uh, is riding down his uh, riding down the glen on his quad bike, and he's coming up towards the the tree. He's left his uh, his woman Margot uh, back at the gamekeeper's cottage, uh, fairly beaten up because uh, she's just told him she's pregnant, uh, and he's not pleased with that uh, concept. So he's uh, he's beaten her up quite heavily, left her bleeding in the cottage. Anyway, here he is on the tree, uh, and this is the tree on the uh, the cover here and uh, the little cogs and wheels have all done their bit and what lies in wait for him lies in wait. The tree loomed close now, dominating the otherwise treeless landscape. A burn bubbled alongside the track. Heather clung to sparse soil, the purple flowers scenting the chill morning air. Higher up the glen, bright yellow gorse and patches of broom signalled summer's approach and then a dark mass of cash crop conifers hugged the distant mountains till they too thinned out in the upper reaches. It was, in its own primitive way, quite beautiful. Oscar saw, but did not comprehend. He slowed down his approach. In places the tree roots lay exposed on the ground, where the bike tars had worn away the surrounding soil. He stood up in his seat to avoid having his bones rattled by the action of tyres over the uneven roots, and his head was at a perfect height to catch the near-invisible wire noose that lay in wait. The force of the impact caused the wire to bite deeply into his neck, almost severing his head from his body as his cervical vertebrae parted with an audible crack. The quad bike carried on without him, before a random stone tipped it into the burn, flooding the engine. The ensuing silence was broken only by the wet, gurgling sounds Oscar made as he jerked uncontrollably on the wire, a percussive counter-melody to the soft, bubbling sound of the burn. Shit and piss stained his rough clothing as his bowels opened involuntarily, pooling under his twitching marionette body to mix with the blood pumping from a neck wound. The wire had opened his flesh to form a gaping red grin, a second mouth, mute and savage. The last thing he saw was the hanging rabbit's quizzical death face, looking more like a final valediction of justice before his world faded into nothingness. The kinetic energy absorbed by the tree destroyed the mechanical construction in the branches above. Carefully carved and engineered bone cogs flew in all directions. The wooden infrastructure turned to matchwood. The parts landed silently in the surrounding heather or fell pattering like tiny hailstones where they impacted the track. Only two steel wires remained, suspending the rabbit and Oscar aloft where they performed an aerial pirouette, bloodied bodies coyly facing each other, then slowly turning away again. The sun shone through the branches and leaves, the dappled light lending a theatrical touch to the macabre scene. Before too long, the first flies scented the feast, and nature began the inevitable process to reclaim her own. In the cottage, Margot was dressed, her long red hair tied back into the ponytail that Oscar preferred. She viewed her face critically in the mirror, makeup and arnica barely disguising the darkening bruise despite layers of foundation. She pursed her lips, applying bright red lipstick as a distraction, a ruse to focus attention away from her eyes. The sheets would need to be washed. She'd bled during the night. Margot stripped the bed, efficient in her movements, even though she held herself awkwardly, body stiff on one side where pain gnawed at her ribs. A new sheet pulled, scented with hint of coconut from the gorse blossoms she'd collected, imprisoned in a muslin bag. She held the bag in her hands, pulling it tight towards her face to drink in the perfume. She felt imprisoned too, trapped in this loveless relationship, captive in this isolated cottage, 
She was the jailer as well as the captive. If only... Margot stopped it there. She could no longer countenance any repeat of that mantra, no exploration of what might have been. If only... The words rang hollow, repeating in her mind despite her willingness to stop. You've made your bed and now must lie in it. Her mother's voice, judgmental, strong with the certainty of religious fervour, hateful. Margot's inability to blindly follow that same narrow path of righteousness her parents trod had driven her to this, unloved, discarded, unfit for the kingdom of heaven. Was it any wonder she had ended up like this, knocked up, knocked about? Just another piece of human garbage nobody cared about. Okay, that's the end of the book launch. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it, and uh, if you want it, it's called Whirly Gig, and it's published by Fledgling Press. Thanks very much for your time, and uh, look after yourselves out there.